Corey Alspite, I'm the director of the Tom and Chuck Foley Institute, mm -hmm. and on behalf of the Institute, uh, I'd like to welcome you out to our event today. Uh, we have with us today, uh, we actually participate with the University of Washington in what's called the EU Fellows Program, and every year the European Union sends a fellow over and they do some work uh, with uh, folks at the University of Washington, and we bring them out here to speak at the uh, WSU as well. And this year, uh, the EU Fellow is Tony Lockett. Tony is a communications specialist who works for the European Commission in Brussels. He has been involved in European Union policymaking for over 15 years, most recently in the area of regional economic development, which accounts for one third of the EU's budget and represents a key element of its strategy to recover from the financial crisis. Tony is currently, like I say, uh, the EU Fellow at the University of Washington, where he is pursuing research on the use of digital media to enhance public engagement with the European Union. Joining me now, welcoming Tony Lockett. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for that introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm here. I've escaped from Brussels for six months. Um, I'm over at the University of Washington, uh, although I gather I shouldn't mention too much about that over here uh, on the Washington State campus. Um, and I'm doing some teaching. Uh, I'm doing some research um, on digital media and politics and how that's affecting the EU. Um, but one of the great things that I get to do while I'm over here is to come out and speak to groups like this one, to come out to the different universities in the region. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward to the discussion this morning. I hope it will be a discussion. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and comments. Um, the subject I was asked to speak about today is um, political polarization and the EU. So I thought that the question I'd uh, try to answer or that we could discuss this morning is whether uh, the financial crisis that we read about so much in the papers, whether this is uh, ultimately making the European Union uh, grow apart or whether it's actually making the European Union come together in a closer way um, even than it has been in the past. Um, and if the technology works, I would like to start by showing you a short video uh, that was produced last year um, around the time that the EU was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. So let's switch to YouTube. Yeah, okay, let's get it all full screen. Are we ready, Richard? We must all turn our backs upon the horrors of the past. We must look to the future. We must build a kind of United States of Europe. Bénéficier du prix Nobel de la paix, c'est être investi d'une mission, c'est-à-dire de véhiculer la paix, les idées de paix partout où c'est possible. L'Europe n'a pas été faite, nous avons eu la guerre. L'Europe ne se fera pas d'un coup, elle se fera par des réalisations concrètes. Es würde mich persönlich sehr berühren, wenn Europa Schaden zugefügt würde in, in dieser kritischen Zeit. Wir haben Probleme, aber wir halten trotzdem dran fest, weil es uns ein sehr, sehr großer Wert und das bedeutet für mich dieser Preis. Pourquoi est-ce qu'en réalité nous avons voulu faire l'Europe au lendemain de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Kraje w latach pierwszej wojny światowej, drugiej wojny światowej walczyły między sobą, prowadziły bardzo zacięte konflikty zbrojne, a teraz jest to po prostu niemożliwe. Jeśli ja miałbym wziąć jutro za karabin i walczyć z moim kolegą z Francji czy, czy z Niemiec, to jest po prostu niewyobrażalne. To jest pierwszy rynek komu. Ces premières institutions supranationales, c'est l'Europe qui commence à s'unir. Este Premio Nobel de la Paz actúa como un factor cohesionador en tiempos en que la economía podría significar guerras económicas. Mais tout de même, retournez-vous un peu. Demandez-vous ce que l'Europe était encore. Il y a 50 ans. En ce moment, la solidarité est peut-être un peu mise à, à rude épreuve, mais euh, du coup, oui, c'est vrai que c'est peut-être bien de, de se rappeler que, que nous, contrairement à nos parents, grands-parents, n'avons pas connu de guerre. Nur mit einem starken, einigen Europa können die Europäer und kann die Welt wirklich gedeihen. 
Seitdem die Mauer gefallen ist, habe ich das Gefühl, endlich zur rechten Zeit zu leben. Denn der Mauerbau war für mich der eigentliche Einschnitt im Leben. Warmly welcome to our family. Our new Europe is born. L'Europe, elle est parfaite pour nous. Elle est faite pour tous les pays européens. Ouvrir nos bras à ces pays, c'était formidable. C'était notre cœur qui parlait. Możemy normalnie żyć, nie musimy się niczego obawiać. Możemy poznawać świat. Le 1er mai 2004, j'étais avec tous ceux qui étaient émus jusqu'à là. Parce que c'était un moment symbolique, notre retour dans la communauté des, des peuples. La Pologne devait trouver sa place. Czuję się z tego dumna i bardzo bym chciała, żeby wszyscy młodzi ludzie, ale no nie tylko młodzi, żeby wszyscy obywatele Polski czuli się tak samo dumni jak ja. Kažem da s 30 godina je čovjek koji je dijete koji je preživio ovaj rat to da još nisam izašao u Evropu i želim da je obiđen, da bude njen građanin, da vidim kako tu ljudi žive, ne moram raditi tamo, znači sam taj osjećaj budi neki izazov. We have today been able to give a very clear message to the Western Balkans. They will become part of our family. Prije svega ja sam bila dijete. Ja sam jako malo da izgubila sam svoju majku. Pa dobro, neke stvari se nikad ne mogu zaboraviti. Ali trebamo gledati naprijed zbog naše djece, zbog... Čisto zbog Bosne i Hercegovine, zbog budućnosti Bosne i Hercegovine. On ne rappellera jamais assez a kjel point cette paix. Dezormais si on racine, la constituje une revolution par rapport a une histoire emaillée au fil des siècles de conflits incessants, dramatiques, sanglants. Ich kann nur sagen, euh, euh, weiter kämpfen. in that video from Europe's past, some of the historical figures who were at the origins of European integration, uh, going back to post-war reconstruction of, of Europe um, in, uh, in the 50s. Also some, com some contemporary voices, uh, and we had a nice mixture of different languages there. Um, so Europe's linguistic diversity, and also perspectives from different countries. Uh, some of the original founding countries of the, uh, of the European project, some countries that have joined more recently, for example Poland, uh, and some countries that would like to become uh, members that have applied to, to join the European Union. Um, and then finally, I think it was interesting to look at that together because I think it explained some of the reasons why I think the Nobel Peace Prize Committee decided uh, to award the European Union the Peace Prize last year. Um, which is to do with Europe's historical contribution uh, to peaceful cooperation, um, to, to peace, uh, you know, on a continent that has been ravaged by war for centuries, uh, going back into history, um, and also the kind of values that underpin uh, the European Union, the way it's helped to support dem democratic transitions in the south of Europe, for example, uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece, um, and the transition from communism uh, in Central and Eastern European. Uh, European countries that joined uh, the EU in 2004 
uh, and 2007. Uh, so you can see here just on the screenshot um, an extract from the, um, the statement from the, the Nobel Committee where they said uh, that the EU and its forerunners have for over six decades contributed to the advancement of peace and reconciliation, democracy and human rights in Europe. Um, so I thought, I mean, what would be interesting perhaps uh, for the presentation today is to think about, you know, how, how much those values are still relevant to Europe, how much uh, those values are still being practiced, um, and whether, you know, as I said in the introduction, uh, the financial crisis is endangering those values, is, uh, you know, forcing the European Union apart and creating splits and tensions, and to what extent it's bringing uh, the European countries closer together. So these, these three gentlemen here, I don't know if uh, uh, you know them or if you recognize them, probably a lot of Europeans wouldn't necessarily recognize them either. Um, on the left, it's Herman van Rompuy, uh, who's the president of the European Council. Uh, in the center is Jose Manuel Barroso, who's the president of the European Commission. Uh, and on the right is Martin Schulz, who's the president of the European Parliament. And this is them picking up their uh, Nobel Pr Peace Prize last December. Um, so I think, I mean, there's quite a lot of evidence that these values of solidarity, of peaceful cooperation, uh, continue to, to inspire what the, uh, the European Union does. And the area where I'm uh, working uh, personally is, is a good example of that, I think. Um, this is um, a map of Europe of the uh, level of economic development, of the level of wealth in the different regions uh, in Europe. And basically the darker red colors are the less well-off regions and the, the green and yellow colors are the more well-off regions. Um, and what you see here is a picture of Europe's increasing economic diversity with the enlargements that have taken place. Um, and so, for example, the, uh, one of the richest regions in Europe where um, Richard and I come from in the inner London uh, is 10 times wealthier than the, uh, some of the poorest regions in Bulgaria. Uh, which joined the EU in 2007. So you have these quite significant economic disparities, um, which obviously makes the single market less efficient because it's uh, you know, not uh, easy to sell goods and services across borders if there are these different um, levels of economic development. So the EU uh, spends about a third of its budget on promoting economic uh, and urban uh, development in, in the regions. Um, and two-thirds of that money goes to the poorest regions. So it's an expression of solidarity. The richer member states pay in a bit more. Uh, the poorer regions and member states get a bit more out of it, but everybody benefits in the end. So it's a good example, practical uh, example of solidarity um, at work. Um, and the EU also shows solidarity with uh, uh, its international partners. Um, it's uh, actually, if you take the EU budget together with national development cooperation budgets. Uh, it's the largest donor of uh, international development aid, also humanitarian aid. Um, and this is a uh, picture that kind of um, sums up the, the, the Chinese proverb, uh, if you give a man fish, uh, you, he'll eat for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. Um, so you know, there's a lot of um, uh, good development cooperation projects going on around the world with uh, support from the European Union uh, as an expression of solidarity internationally. Um, the EU is also um, heavily involved in uh, peacekeeping operations around the world. This is an image from Kosovo, uh, where the EU uh, is working with the local police and customs officials to uh, provide training uh, and capacity for them uh, to be able to, to police the borders um, and, uh, and deal with um, customs issues. Um, and also within Europe, um, there are a lot of examples even today of where European cooperation is uh, promoting uh, peace. This is uh, a bridge in Derry uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, the EU has been a, a strong supporter of the Northern Ireland peace process over the last decade. It's spent over a billion euros uh, on peace and rec reconciliation projects in Northern Ireland. Uh, and this bridge is one symbol of that. It's bridging the two uh, communities, um, the Protestant and Catholic communities um, in, in that town of uh, Derry in Northern Ireland. Um, but, you know, it's not all a rosy picture. And uh, as we all know, we all read the papers. Um, the EU faces some quite <coughs> significant challenges linked to the economic crisis. Um, I made a, a presentation on the economic issues yesterday, and today I won't go into quite so much detail on the economics, but just a couple of slides to give you a picture of um, some of the impacts of the crisis on Europe. Uh, this is the evolution of GDP over the last uh, decade or so. Um, 
the EU is the blue line, the dotted uh, blue line is the euro area, so the 17 EU countries that have adopted the euro as their cu common currency. Um, the yellow, uh, the solid yellow line is Japan, and the dotted yellow line is the U United States. So you can see clearly, in fact, very much the same trend uh, in Europe, but also here on this side of the Atlantic, this huge dip um, in GDP with negative growth, um, beginning with the banking crisis in 2008, um, with growth recovering somewhat over the last couple of years. But the latest forecasts from our um, Economic and Financial Affairs Commissioner, Oli Wren, um, just a few days ago, that he, he did his winter uh, economic forecast for the, the EU, and the growth prospects for the, for the next year are looking pretty poor in Europe. We're looking at kind of zero, 0 0.1 growth across the European Union. So a continuing challenge um, that the EU faces is reigniting growth in the economy um, and recovering from the financial crisis. And perhaps one of the, the most tragic uh, aspects of this story is the social impacts um, of the crisis. Um, and this is a chart showing the evolution of unemployment uh, over the last decade. Again, comparing uh, the euro area, which here on this chart is in blue, uh, the 27 EU member states, which is in yellow, and then here the US is in uh, kind of uh, crimson color, <coughs> and Japan along the bottom in a lighter blue. Uh, so you can see here again, looking back to the when the crisis hits uh, in 2008-2009, Unemployment shot up uh, in Europe, also here in the US, but um, we can see here uh, the employment situation improving somewhat here on this side of the Atlantic over the last uh, year and a half or so, uh, with unemployment coming down, whereas in Europe uh, it's continuing <coughs> to rise in many countries, and some of the countries worst hit by the crisis um, that we've heard a lot about uh, in the papers, <coughs> Greece, Spain, Italy, um, have unemployment rates around the 25% mark. Uh, for young people like you coming out of education, um, you know, facing, they're facing a very <coughs> grim future. Youth unemployment in Spain, for example, is running at about 50%, so one out of two young people uh, unable to find work. And obviously these social impacts um, are, are, are having, um, you know, of great concern to, the, to my colleagues in, in the Commission and the other EU institutions. Um, and, you know, we've seen uh, the political impacts also uh, that, that that situation is having on electoral politics around the EU. We've just had the Italian uh, elections. We've just had the Bulgarian government that's fallen um, over uh, austerity uh, measures and uh, uh, economic and social issues. So it's having quite some uh, political impacts as well as social impacts. So I'd like to go on now to consider what some of those impacts are in terms of um, you know, political polarization, in terms of uh, the, the, the political situation in the EU currently. Um, and here I've got a quote um, from uh, the Commission President, uh, José Manuel Barroso, who gave an interview to David Miliband, uh, former British uh, Foreign Minister um, uh, for the New Statesman magazine just a, a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, President Barroso said, we should not forget that there are old demons in Europe, uh, extreme nationalism, populism, xenophobia, you see in times of crisis that extremist forces, populist forces, have a better ground to oversimplify things and to manipulate feelings. Uh, and I think here he was referring to um, uh, worrying um, trends that we've seen in a number of member states um, with uh, dis debates, for example, on immigration, the treatment of the Roma in Central and Eastern European countries, um, the rise of parties um, with uh, xenophobic or um, uh, racist uh, views on, on minorities. Um, and uh, this is certainly a trend that is worrying decision makers in the European Union um, and you know, would potentially uh, endanger Europe's heritage of uh, promoting democracy um, and peaceful cooperation uh, on the continent. So a very worrying uh, trend here in terms of um, rising extremism and intolerance. Um, I've got another quote here from the German president um, who wrote an article just a couple of weeks ago um, where he says, in some member states people are afraid of becoming the paymasters of the crisis. So this is referring to the debate in Germany um, which has had to uh, pick up a lot of the bill, let's say, um, for the uh, economic and financial crisis. 
the EU has set up a, a, a European stability mechanism where basically they've pooled money to help countries like Greece that are experiencing financial difficulties. But in the, uh, in the German debate, um, particularly in the popular press in Germany, um, this has led to some kind of uh, you know, stereotyping of uh, Greeks and other um, uh, EU citizens from the southern European countries. Uh, there have been several headlines in Bilt newspaper in Germany about lazy Greeks, etc. Um, and so uh, in Germany, uh, there's this feeling that uh, perhaps Germany is, is, is um, having to pay in uh, um, more than it wants in terms of picking up the, uh, the cost of dealing with the crisis and, and getting the European economy going. Uh, he goes on to say, in other countries, there's a growing fear of constant austerity measures and social decline. So here, um, you know, we've seen uh, demonstrations on the streets in Madrid, in Greece on Syntagma Square in, fr in front of the parliament. Uh, we've seen the Italian uh, election results, uh, which I imagine many, some of you may want to uh, talk about or ask questions about um, just recently. Uh, so the, the austerity policies which have um, been applied in many of the EU countries as they try to get government debt down with reductions in, in public budgets, um, in social spending, um, is triggering off a lot of social protest and a lot of um, uh, concern about the impact of austerity on uh, Europe's economies and on the social situation. Um, and then to continue, he says, to many EU citizens, giving and taking, borrowing and lending, responsibility and contribution seem no longer rightly and fairly divided within the community of Europeans. So he seems to be saying here that, you know, that the, the, the links that binds the European countries together, uh, traditional mechanisms of solidarity, that they're, they're being stretched to a point where in the political uh, decision-making sphere, in public opinion, uh, people um, don't feel that um, uh, decisions are, are, are being taken. Uh, in, in, in the correct way in, in the policy making process at the European Union level. Um, and then this guy um, who Richard and I uh, know well um, and who I think has had quite some press coverage over here as well, David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, uh, created quite some waves a few weeks ago with uh, uh, his uh, latest speech about Europe um, where um, I mean, I won't read out the whole quote, but uh, he basically promised uh, the British people that there would be a, a referendum in 2017, um, and that in, in, in the interim between now and then, he would uh, renegotiate with his European partners the terms of uh, Britain's membership of the, the European Union. Um, and then he would offer a referendum, um, basically whether he would offer people the choice whether to stay in the European Union or whether to leave the European Union. So again, is this uh, another sign that the EU uh, is pulling apart um, due to the, the impacts of uh, the financial crisis? And then just a, a final quote on, on, on this kind of uh, you know, growing apart, growing together type of issue. Um, here's a quote from Viviane Redding, who's one of the vice presidents of the European Commission. Um, and she was just recently speaking in Coimbra in Portugal. And she was quite critical. Um, <coughs> of uh, heads of government who meet in the European Council in Brussels um, and who very often um, you know, are seen to be championing, uh, championing their national interests, their, their uh, national positions uh, over and above the European collective interest. And she said, uh, I wish that heads of state and government would go to uh, the TV and the journalists after the European Council meetings and say, I have helped to bring Europe forward because that is good for my country. Um, as opposed to saying, um, as we saw at the re recent European Council with the discussions on the uh, future of the budget, um, you know, where each member state seemed to say, you know, I've got something out of this for my country. I've saved the British budget rebate. Uh, you know, Poland saying I've got some more money from the cohesion funds. So making an appeal to the European collective interest as opposed uh, to uh, defending narrow national interests. So again, is this further evidence of the fact that the member states of the European Union are pulling apart and that this sense of collective interest, which we saw um, in the video about the historical evolution of the EU, um, you know, has been one of the, the great strengths of the European project. Um, well, then, that, that seem, seems to paint quite a gloomy picture, but then I, I um, want to begin suggesting now that maybe there's a, there's a, there's a more positive side to the story. Um, and this is uh, Rahm Emanuel, who was uh, President Obama's former chief of staff. And in the early 
um, days of the Obama presidency and the crisis, he, he said, uh, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. And it may, a crisis may be an opportunity to uh, do things um, that wouldn't otherwise have been politically possible without that um, impetus of having to deal uh, with a very serious crisis uh, like, like the, the financial crisis has been uh, over here and in Europe. Um, and then this is one of the, the kind of great heroes of the Euro crisis um, over in Europe, Mario Draghi, the president of the European Central Bank. Um, and there'd been a lot of turbulence in the financial markets last year and people were kind of betting against, uh, against the fact that Greece might be, be kicked out of the Euro. Did the member states have the political will to keep Greece in? And Mario Draghi came out with this very strong statement uh, in the middle of last year in the summer um, where he said, within our mandate, the European Central Bank is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the Euro. And believe me, it will be enough. And just that rhetoric, um, you know, just saying that in such a blunt and, uh, and direct way, um, a lot of people credit that with the calming of the, the financial markets during the second half of last year, the reduction of the spreads of interest rates between um, the countries that are, are suffering the worst from the financial crisis and, and uh, better off member states. So this was a, a, a sign last year of uh, the very strong political will that existed not just in the European Central Bank but also amongst the member states and this was echoed um, by comments from Chancellor Merkel and other EU leaders that basically they would do whatever it took to keep Greece in the Eurozone uh, and that Greece would not um, fall out and default on its debts. And then I think, um, you know, despite all the, all the, 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 the um, signs I showed of political turbulence and, and, and this tension pulling apart and strains on, on the uh, solidarity between member states, in a way you have to judge uh, the situation by uh, the facts and by the deeds uh, as much as by, um, you know, uh, the, the, the rhetoric and, and um, the statements that are made. And if you look at the action that's been taken in Europe to deal with the financial crisis over the last uh, year or so, it's actually quite remarkable. I mean, if you, if you work in EU decision-making, um, you know, which is what I've been doing for the last 15, 20 years, you know that decisions can very often take a long time. If you're working with 27 member states and you have to get them to agree, you have to bring in the European Parliament, different interest groups, um, you know, very often it's difficult to make uh, quick progress at the European level. But if you look at the list of decisions that have been taken just over the last year, um, really it's quite impressive. And a lot of these are things that have been uh, you know, on the cards or people have been asking for for quite some time and that would politically have been unthinkable perhaps even a year ago, and nevertheless um, the member states have come together and, and uh, found agreements. So first of all, the, um, the, the European Stability Mechanism, which is um, a 500 billion euro financial firewall, so basically a pot of money that countries experiencing financial difficulties can call on um, if they uh, are experiencing problems uh, borrowing money on the uh, international markets. So member states pooling very considerable uh, financial resources from their national budgets um, in that European stability mechanism. Uh, secondly, member states accepting the principle of European supervision and regulation of banks. So there was an agreement last year in October uh, on a banking union uh, whereby the European Central Bank would directly supervise the biggest European banks. Um, and then there would be a system of indirect supervision for all of the smaller national and regional banks. Um, and we've also heard this morning on the news, I don't know if you've heard it over here, but there's been a decision taken to uh, regulate bankers' bonuses, uh, to put a cap on that, so which is something I think that uh, is, a, is a controversial issue um, probably over here with Wall Street and so on as well. Um, thirdly, um, stricter enforcement of um, the rules on economic and monetary union. One of the problems we had during the financial crisis was that there were rules about the level of government debt, about government deficits that had been put in place, but there weren't really uh, tough sanctions and there weren't teeth to enforce those rules. And basically decisions on taxation and on spending were left to the discretion of national governments. Uh, and that's what has allowed this huge increase, or one of the things that's allowed this huge increase in sovereign debt in, in several of the countries that are experiencing difficulties. Um, and now um, the member states have accepted stricter enforcement of these rules, including uh, financial penalties and sanctions. Um, they have to sign up to debt reduction targets when they draw down money from the European Stability Mechanism. 
So there's far stricter enforcement from the European level uh, of these governance rules. And that includes uh, the Commission and the EU institutions having a say over national budgets. So again, more signs of the European countries working together um, and pooling sovereignty rather than pulling apart. Um, and there's also uh, greater coordination of uh, economic and fiscal policies so that um, you know, the cycle um, in the different member states is, is closer together. Um, and the Commission's recently come out with proposals for a financial transaction tax, which is something that people have been campaigning for for many years, um, you know, the so-called Tobin tax or Robin Hood tax, so to tax financial transactions. Um, and again, this is something that politically would have been unthinkable um, perhaps uh, only a year ago. Um, but uh, 11 member states have decided that they want to go ahead with this. Uh, it's certainly not uncontroversial, and there are critics. Um, but it's another sign of increased willingness, I think, to work together um, at the European level to uh, deal with um, these challenges. Um, I'd like now to move on to the kind of third and final part of my presentation, which is um, about the impact of the crisis on, uh, on public opinion. Um, and here I've got a chart which is taken from some opinion polling, which the European Commission does every quarter where we question uh, a representative sample of a thousand adults from each of the EU countries and ask them questions on a whole range of issues. And this is one question that's included in all of the uh, surveys. It's about whether people have a positive, neutral or negative image of the EU. Um, and the blue line is the positive responses, the red line is the negative and the neutral is the um, yellow line in the middle. So you can see again quite clearly on the timeline here going back to 2006 that um, people who had a positive impression of the EU were roughly around the 50% mark until the crisis hits uh, in 2008-2009. And then we've seen a very steep decline to 30% only of people who uh, say that they have a positive impression of the EU uh, in the last survey which was done last autumn. Uh, and then you see the negative um, comments uh, rising in parallel and all the two almost meeting um, uh, with 30% positive and 29% negative uh, in the last survey that was done. Um, and in fact, this is part of a kind of broader decline of public trust in institutions generally. Um, it's not just about the EU. In fact, if you look more in more detail at the figures, this is actually levels of trust in the European Union, uh, which is the blue line, and then the red line is national parliaments, and the yellow line is national governments. So you can see that um, decline in support and for and trust in the EU uh, has declined, but it's actually still above um, levels of trust uh, for national governments, which have fallen uh, to even lower levels. So there's a general problem uh, of trust in uh, political institutions um, across, uh, across the member states. And in fact, if you, if you look at it more globally, um, the, the company Edelman does uh, every year something that they call the Trust Barometer. Um, they just published the 2013 edition uh, during the World Economic Forum in Davos. And in fact, globally, there's a decline of trust in institutions, um, whether it's, in fact, the, the institution, curiously, that people trust the most is business over government um, and over the media. Um, so the, in, in our increasingly individualistic <coughs> societies, there is this phenomen general phenomenon of decline in trust uh, in institutions of various kinds. Um, and I think that's part of the bigger picture of what's going on uh, in Europe. It's part of uh, a bigger phenomenon of declining trust in institutions. Um, and this kind of brings me on to the issue that fascinates me and what I'm working on uh, during my fellowship which is how uh, digital media are changing politics. Um, and these are the two examples that people uh, very often quote. There's uh, the Obama 2008 campaign particularly, also the 2012 campaign, where he used digital media uh, in a very savvy way to mobilize support, uh, to get people out canvassing, to raise funds. Um, and this picture on the right here is from the Arab Spring. It's a peop, uh, picture from Tahrir Square in Egypt. And again, uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, are seen as having played a very important role uh, in allowing people to organize, in allowing people to, to share information and, and, and broadcast uh, the events that were happening there in Egypt at the time and to, to mobilize uh, support. <coughs> 
and digital media is changing politics and maybe it's changing politics in the European Union as well. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but this year is the European Year of Citizens, 2013. Um, and the Commission has actually said um, we want to use this as an opportunity to develop a new kind of way of doing politics at the European Union level of policy making. Uh, so all of the members of the Commission are going out of Brussels to the member states, uh, to capitals, but also to the regions um, and conducting town hall debates. They're in listening mode, so they're uh, listening to concerns that people have about the crisis, about other issues what they think the EU should be doing, how it should be working. So it's, it's an exercise in, in listening, and it's very much relayed by digital media because it's uh, based around physical meetings, but each time there's an opportunity for people to comment and discuss online uh, on various social media platforms. So this is just one example, uh, interesting example, I think, about how digital media are changing policy making in the EU. Um, <clears throat> this is another example which is, uh, relates to um, uh, the, something called ACTA, which was the Anti-Counterfeiting anti Trade Agreement. Um, it was a similar kind of issue to the uh, discussion on SOPA and PIPA over here in the US. Um, so it was basically an international trade agreement on intellectual property, which was designed to protect rights holders. Um, but people who are concerned about internet freedom uh, were concerned that some of the provisions of that treaty uh, would limit internet freedom, um, would protect big business over um, internet users. And there was an unprecedented uh, campaign relayed by digital media. This is, uh, these are pictures from the European Parliament. Um, and they managed to mobilize enough support to deliver a three million signature petition to the European Parliament. Um, and as a result of that, the European Parliament used new powers that it had acquired under the Lisbon Treaty to reject uh, this international trade agreement which had been negotiated between the EU uh, and its international partners. So this is just one example about of how digital media are also changing the way uh, social movements operate and the way civil society interacts with the EU institutions. It's a new feature um, of policy making in the EU context. And then this is, and this is my final slide. Um, there's a lot of, I don't know, uh, how many of you are studying politics or international relations or EU? Some of you. In, in a lot of the EU academic literature um, about the EU, um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, is there a democratic deficit in the EU? Uh, is it sufficiently accountable? And one issue that people have pointed to is, is this idea, is there, is there a public sphere in the EU? Is there a place you know, through the media or in uh, another form where people can talk about uh, EU issues across uh, national borders. And until now, people have looked and kind of more or less come to the conclusion that there wasn't a European public sphere because media tend to be nationalized or even regionalized. And so there wasn't this space, uh, you know, which a healthy democracy needs where people could debate uh, um, issues relating to the, to the European Union. Um, and I think what's very interesting is that with digital media again, uh, we see actually now the emergence of an online uh, public sphere which does go across national borders. And these are just a, a small collection of the 15,000 tweets um, that were sent out uh, around the last European Council in Brussels when they were discussing the budget. So you had, for example, uh, civil society organizations like the European Youth Forum lobbying the heads of government and saying, but how come in the EU we spend more money on cows than on young people? So looking at the agricultural bud budget compared to the education budget. Um, you had journalists, uh, like the one in the top left here, um, uh, sharing tips and insider comments that they received here. He'd been talking to the Swedish Prime Minister about um, you know, the dynamics of the negotiations. You have EU leaders like uh, Herman van Rompuy, the council president, who announced the, uh, the final agreement via Twitter. The president of the European Parliament saying, hang on a minute, the parliament has to agree to this. Uh, we don't think the budget is, is, uh, is sufficiently high or, or uh, responds to our political demands. Um, you have individual MEPs talking about how they're going to vote on, uh, on the budget. You have the British Prime, prime Minister, again, this rather sort of uh, um, focusing on national interests, saying, I fought off attempts to undermine the British rebate uh, in the European Council. So I think, I mean, for those of you who might be studying uh, European integration and EU politics, this is a, a really quite interesting development, because I think for the first time, 
we see the emergence of this kind of European public sphere through digital media that academics have uh, been looking for for a long time uh, and haven't found. And th there's not much that's being written about that, so I think it's a promising uh, area of research. So that brings me to the end of the, the presentation. I mean, I think by way of conclusion, what I try to argue is that um, you know, the EU has a long history of um, promoting pr peaceful cooperation in Europe, uh, of showing solidarity between the member states and also more widely in the world. That those uh, fundamental values have been uh, um, uh, uh, subjected to some tensions uh, because of the financial crisis. We see a, a, a tension um, because of the austerity policies, because of the social and economic challenges that the EU faces. But I think if you look beyond the news headlines uh, at what the EU is actually doing, I think the picture isn't quite so negative as um, you know, we often read about in the papers. And there's quite a lot of evidence that the crisis is actually making the European countries work more closely together um, as they deal with the crisis rather than pulling apart. So that would be my conclusion. But you're very welcome to take issue with that. And I'm sure we'll have, uh, um, with the remaining time, an interesting uh, discussion. Yeah. Um, is there? I'm wondering what the sense is now amongst <coughs> policymakers in Brussels. Do they think that that was a mistake to adopt this this austerity measure, or is there a sense that either it was reckless policy at this point? Or well, I mean, the, there's a very very lively debate about that amongst the European countries and amongst the EU institutions uh, currently. I mean, the context in the EU is quite different um, because, I mean, the EU is not a country like the US and our, our European Union budget is much smaller than the federal budget in the US. It's only 1% of GDP. So we simply don't have the resources at the EU level to have the kind of stimulus package um, that you had uh, here in, in the US because that money is, is in national budgets. So it's at the discretion of either national or regional governments, you know, to pump money into the economy. Uh, in that way. I mean, what's being done at the European Union level, particularly with the structural funds, the aid that goes for, to regional and urban development, is at least to try to make sure that that money is used as effectively as possible. So my colleagues back in Brussels have been doing a lot of reprogramming of European money to make sure that you know every euro is used wisely and that it really goes to growth, uh, growth enhancement and job creation. Um, so there's a very lively uh, debate about that. I mean, um, there, yeah, I mean, basically, just to, it's, to characterize, it's, it, there's the kind of austerity, get down the budget deficits first side of the argument, and then there's the growth first, uh, let's you know, put more money into, into growth creation. And, and you know, those are issues that economists and politicians uh, argue about all the time. And we've seen here in the US, it's not all, always easy to get those you know, taxation and spending uh, decisions right, and there are arguments across the political spectrum. I mean, there have been political changes in the EU because of the electoral cycle. So we had François Hollande coming in as French president last year, so being more ro robust on, on growth, um, you know, and back it backed up um, to, to a large extent by, by the EU institutions, by the Commission, by the Parliament. Um, but uh, for the moment, I think some people would argue that the austerity side of the argument is winning out you know, in those discussions in the Council. And because of the particular role of the European Central Bank as well, which unlike your Federal Reserve, you know, only is only in existence really to, to fight inflation. It doesn't have this growth promoting mandate. Um, so it's, it's, it's an open debate and you know, I'm sure we'll see you know, both sides arguing it out and continuing to argue, argue it out. There's no consensus in Brussels. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, th I don't think there is a, ever a consensus on, on these kind of things, is there, um, you know, this is because there, there are different, you know, philosophical and, and uh, intellectual sides of the argument. Um, but I think, I mean, it's clear there are, there are, there are the two challenges. Uh, I mean, there's very high levels of public, uh, I mean, actually, if you, look at, if you look at the figures overall, government debt in, in Europe is actually, is actually lower than in the EU. It's about 83% overall in Europe and 103% in the US. But we've got some countries that have racked up very high levels of public debt. I mean, Greece is the example that everybody 
talks about, but Italy, um, you know, is a big economy with high levels of public debt. So there's definitely concerns about getting those unsustainable levels of debt down, but also, you know, there's a concern about reigniting growth in the economy and, and creating jobs and dealing with the social side of, of the issue. Yep. I think this is a good question. Um, I'm just kind of yeah, wondering, sure. um, what is the relationship between the United States and NATO? And, and you know, how, how closely, I guess, economically are they mm -hmm. related? So if something happens in the European Union, how does that affect our economy? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, uh, there's a huge trade and investment relationship already between the EU and the US. Um, I mean, just I was looking up the figures just for Washington State alone. Uh, there's about 50,000 jobs that depend on European investments here in Washington State. Uh, and Europe bought $10 billion worth of goods and services from Washington State alone last year. Uh, so um, <laughs> there's already a very healthy... <laughs> There's already a very healthy trade and investment relationship between the EU and the US. Um, and you probably heard President Obama in his State of the Union speech. Um, he announced that the EU and the US would begin negotiating a trade and investment partnership, so to take the relationship to a higher level. Because more or less all trade is, is um, barrier free between the EU and, and the US. But um, I mean, there are some areas which are more sensitive, like agriculture, particularly, which I'm sure is an issue around this part of the country. Um, and there are also some kind of technical issues to do with standards, food, food standards, for example. Um, so there will be some tricky issues in those negotiations, but the objective, I think, on both sides is to you know, have even more uh, clo closer economic ties between, uh, between the two. Yep. Uh, Um, well, especially since I'm on camera, I'm not sure if I want to <laughs> answer that question uh, quite in those terms. But I think, um, uh, I mean, in the debate in Europe, uh, Germany and the German Chancellor, uh, Mrs. Merkel, are seen as having quite a rigorous position in terms of getting levels of uh, sovereign debt down and um, so what people um, call austerity, um, cutting uh, spending in those countries that have um, high levels of, of public debt. Um, so there may be a kind of um, uh, intellectual or philosophical similarity between the position of Germany and some of the um, representatives of the Republican uh, Party here in, in the US on, on those issues. Um, but uh, Germany, to be fair, is also um, putting a lot of money into helping uh, Greece and other European countries, you know, deal with their problems through the European stability mechanism. So I don't think it would be fair to characterize Greece as, you know, all, all cuts and no spending, you know, since they are um, making quite a substantial contribution. I think you've got a question from <laughs> the austerity in the EU has stopped the Greece and the uh, vice I, th I think there are a lot of people who would argue that. Um, I mean, even the IMF recently um, published a, su a study where they um, talked about fiscal accelerators. So basically, if you take money out of the economy uh, in public spending, it actually reduces economic growth far, m far more than that because there are all, s all sorts of spin-off effects. Um, so reducing public spending, I think a lot of people would argue, um, you know, is not necessarily the best way of getting growth back and creating jobs. Um, but, you know, having said that, I mean, having, you know, 150% GDP uh, sovereign debt level is perhaps not, not good economic policy either. So, you know, there are both, both sides of the argument. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you were first, sir, and then the gentleman in the back. Could you continue on, on, that, uh, um, on that line of, 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 of comparison with a particular perhaps attention to the, the fiscal crisis clearly had all sorts of different kinds of groups, but many of them involved uh, well, sort of real lack of, of deep regulation of financial institutions and banking mm. institutions. And, the, uh, and my general sense is the United States has not responded particularly well to what has done some things in terms of curing some of the sort of the grotesque abuses. Mm. Of the European Union has, in 
fact, any of the mechanisms you talked about uh, uh, had some of the equivalent or even sort of a better road record than we have? Um, I mean, I don't know the, the regulatory situation in the U.S. sufficiently well to make a comparison, but I mean, what, what I can say is that, I mean, I think a lot of people would say that one of the causes of the financial crisis is the deregulation of financial services, um, you know, that took place from, from the 80s um, onwards. Um, and that perhaps, you know, some more regulation needs to be put in place um, in order to prevent this kind of thing happening again. And that's precisely what has been happening in the European Union. Um, uh, I mean, I mentioned earlier on that there was a decision taken um, in the European Parliament earlier today to cap bankers' bonuses um, in, U in Europe. And that is actually part of a, a broader package of financial services regulation, which would also seek to, um, you know, split the different the, the in investment banking and what some people would regard as more risky uh, financial services from uh, consumer banking and, you know, people's home loans and uh, uh, pension plans and, and, and so on. Um, and also to make sure that banks have uh, sufficient capital reserves so that they don't, um, you know, uh, lend too much money and then collapse and have to be bailed out by the taxpayer, as we saw um, in Europe and also over here. Um, in in the U.S., so uh, that certainly is part of the package of uh, you know the, the the measures that I I mentioned is about regulating financial services, and the crisis has you know provided a very strong impetus for some pretty stringent measures that wouldn't politically have uh, flown uh, in the past. I mean, th they're far from being um, uncontroversial, and, and the U.K., which is you know London, which is a Big financial services centre is 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 um, you know rather critical of some of the uh, the measures, including you know the cap on bankers' bonuses, because they think if you want to attract talent to the city of London, they have to you know receive these multi-million uh, pound or euro bonuses. Um, but there seems to be um, a majority opinion in the European Union that um, there should be stricter regulation. Um, I mean, personally, as a, as a Brit working in the in the European institutions, I think that would be a great shame. I mean, I think it would be a great shame for the UK because I'm not convinced that it's in our national interest uh, to withdraw from the European Union. On the contrary, I think it would be damaging for for Britain and the British economy. Um, and I think it, you know, um, a lot of um, European leaders have said it would be a great shame for Europe as well for um, Britain to leave because it has, you know. Uh, it's an in influential country in the world, and it's um, you know part of uh, part of the, uh, the 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 European uh, project. So, I th I think um, what is quite worrying is if you look at the latest opinion polling, um, the Financial Times did a poll a couple of weeks ago, and it seems if a referendum were held today, a huge majority of the British public would vote to leave the European Union. Um, and I mean, having worked on communication in the UK. Uh, I think, I mean, there's a huge problem with misinformation. Um, you know, people generally don't really know much about the European Union. They don't care, to be honest, very much about the European Union either. If they do have an opinion, it tends to be quite negative and often not in, in the most informed uh, way. So I think there's a huge information deficit there. And, you know, a lot of people would say that the British media hasn't done the best job over the last 10, 20 years in in terms of objective reporting about how the European Union works and, and uh, the kind of things it does. So, you know, I, I would hope personally between now and 2017 that there could be uh, a bit of action taken to, to, to deal with that information deficit in, in the UK and that might help to turn uh, public opinion around. But uh, for those of – I'm not sure – can I count you as a pro-European Brit as well, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> I think for, for us pro-European Brits, I mean, it, 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 it's not looking very uh, encouraging, the, the situation, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, some, like, you mentioned, like, lazy groups and some, like, the sense of national identity and things like yeah. that. And I guess it's kind of a follow-up to that question. Mm -hmm. How big of a priority is stemming this sense of national identity and trying to go away from the European Union? How big mm -hmm. of a priority is that? Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to <coughs> give the impression that the European Union wants to 
get get away f or get rid of national identities or regional identities um, because you know people we all have multiple I identities uh, and you know people can feel a strong sense of attachment to their region or their country but also to to the European Union which is the way that people actually do feel in a, in a lot of countries but I think what is worrying uh, certainly is more sort of you know xenophobic uh, expressions of um, nationalism um, and there, I mean, the European Union has some powers to take action. I mean, we certainly have legislation uh, preventing uh, racial and religious discrimination at work, in education, housing, and you know, a whole range of other, other sectors. So people can take legal action. I mean, one of the jobs um, that I was personally involved in during the enlargement process was uh, talking to the exceeding countries about the way they treat minorities, particularly the Roma in Central and Eastern Europe. And the EU is quite influential in getting them to change their national legislation and set up um, equality bodies and tribunals that would hear discrimination cases. And that has helped, you know, to a certain extent um, by giving people the possibility to, to exercise their, their legal rights. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, the EU can't uh, have a direct influence on, on the emergence of, of, let's say, political parties like uh, the Front National in France or Jobbik in, in Hungary, who, um, you know, espouse um, these kind of uh, xenophobic uh, views. That's not something where the European Union has the power to, to, to intervene directly in any case. Yep. But it's interesting to link it to the crisis that they decreased intolerance. But I think that that actually started a little bit earlier. I remember 2000s already. We started in the Netherlands, in yeah. Belgium, in uh, people with Austria. Yeah, Austria, yeah, with the Haida. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was interested as well in that identity story because if I was listening to your um, talk, it sounds like the um, polarization is more on the mass level, not on the government. So, um, especially in the more well-to-do European countries, mm. um, there is this popular belief that they pay too much in order to help the other countries. Mm. But on the national government level, yeah. they are still very much in favor of helping out the other countries. And yeah. Do you think that there's a difference in terms of polarization among the mass and among the government level? Or? I mean, I, I think the thing that's a great shame is that... Um, I mean, people who see the EU through the, the through narrow national interest, they kind of see it, see it as a zero-sum game. It's like, you know, do we win or do we lose? Whereas the way it has worked traditionally and the way it should work, I think, is that, you know, if there's an agreement, uh, everybody stands to, to gain. And I, I think that was the thing that Vivienne Redding was criticizing in her comment, that nowadays, you know, from uh, the part of the, the heads of government, there's too much of this sort of nationalists, you know, we defended our national interest and we got what we wanted from the budget and we got this and we got that, which may reflect a kind of broader sentiment in public opinion uh, and the pressures they're under electorally and, you know, through the media in, in, their, in their countries. But that, that is something certainly from the perspective of the European institutions that, you know, we would find quite worrying because they should, they should be entering into these negotiations more in a spirit of, you know, we're all in this together and, you know, if we, if we all give and take a little bit, then we all stand to benefit. Which I, th I think, you know, to be fair, some of the decisions they've reached, you know, they do reflect that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there the cer the certainly is that um, sort of reflex. Perhaps, as you say, it probably predates the crisis, but to, you know, for people to, to sort of hang on to levels of governance that w they seem to have more control over, whether that's national level or even the regional level. I mean, we've seen the emergence of regional movements in, in, in Catalonia, in, 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 in Scotland. So, that, I mean, there are these tensions between different levels of governance. Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of think about, thinking about it more from the positive side in terms of how can it help the EU to open up a bit, to involve people more in policy making, kind of the kind of open government type of approach. But it's true, I mean, as you say, that these digital tools aren't just being used uh, by sort of people who are in favor of European cooperation, 
I mean, if you if you do a search on YouTube uh, for European Union, you'll come up with a whole series of Eurosceptic videos or uh, Nigel Farage from the UK Independence Party in the Parliament, you know, saying what a waste of time and money the European Union is. Um, and also, you know, more worryingly even than that, um, by, you know, racist and xenophobic movements who, uh, you know, use digital media very much to organize and to, uh, to exchange across national, national borders. Uh, so there is definitely a worrying side to digital uh, media, and I mean it's something also that the um, the EU is monitoring in terms of you know um, uh, and counterterrorism and, and tackling racism and xenophobia to kind of monitor those movements um, <coughs> and to to also keep an eye on on the negative uh, side of, of digital media. So you do, do thanks for bringing that up because I don't want to <laughs> just give one side of the story. There is also that side to. to Time is up. Uh, those of you who might be here for a class, uh, just let me remind you that there's uh, some sign-up sheets down at the end of the hall. Uh, and uh, join me now in thanking Tony for a really interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.